I'm Nick Westergaard, and this is On Brand, helping you tell your story. This week, we have a special holiday episode of the On Brand podcast with the naughty and nice brands of 2023. This seasonally appropriate snapshot of brand behavior was developed by the smart folks at Brand Federation. The consultancy's chief growth officer, Matt Williams, joins us to discuss which brands have been naughty and nice this year. As a reminder, Matt Williams is Chief Growth Officer of Brand Federation, a brand strategy and consultancy in Richmond, Virginia. Prior to joining Brand Federation in 2019, Williams was the CEO of the Martin Agency, one of the world's most recognized advertising agencies, where he managed strategy development for world-class brands like Geico, Oreo, UPS, Discover Financial, Walmart, and more. Williams is also clinical professor in the marketing department at the Mason School of Business at William & Mary. He teaches in the MBA program and is the developer and faculty director of the school's online master's in marketing. My interview with Matt Williams is coming right up, but first... Hey there, it's Jason Falls. If your company or maybe one of your clients sells to marketers, you look for advertising channels that guarantee business marketers are paying attention, right? Let me introduce you to the Marketing Podcast Network. You're listening to it right now. It's a network of podcasts all about marketing. So 100% of MPN's audience are marketers. Reach them by advertising on the Marketing Podcast Network. Learn more and find our media kit at marketingpodcasts.net. Support for this and all the other podcasts on the Marketing Podcast Network is provided by Momento. Yes, you can use AI to make your job as a marketer easier. Momento is built to put the power of AI in your hands. It can write social media captions, have it watch or listen to a podcast and suggest, then automatically create social media posts to promote the show. Heck, it can even listen to a podcast episode, then write a poem about it you can use on your company blog. Go check it out. MPN listeners can try it for free at bit.ly slash Memento MPN. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash Memento M-P-N. Matt Williams, welcome back to On Brand. Thank you, Nick. It's great to be here. It's always fun to wrap up the year this way. It is. And here we are, the 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 week of the the big event. No marketers. I'm not talking about the Super Bowl. I'm talking about Christmas itself. And we have sort of a, a Christmas gift on the on brand podcast. And that is, I think, the the third appearance of branding Santa Claus, Matt Williams of of brand federation (laughs) yes yeah a few pounds lighter and less facial hair but still the spirit of santa lives on you know you know we'll call it a rebrand of santa (laughs) and i like it and why i always love chatting with you is because brand federation puts out this great list of naughty and nice brands and every year, Matt graciously joins us and walks us through the naughty brands, uh, the nice brands, what we can learn from each. But the exciting thing this year is that we not only have the list of those brands, but we also, and this is where Matt as Santa uh, factors in, because it's brands that Santa is watching in 2024. So we've got... We've got a new category in our list. You know, in looking at this, it seems like we usually start with naughty, and I'm not sure if there's a, a strategy to that, but that's certainly the order of the cadence of 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 naughty or nice. So let's let's kick things off once again with the naughty list for brands uh, in 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 2023. So is there? Is there a leader in naughtiness or is it just a collective category of shame? (laughs) You know, brand shame. It's unfortunately (laughs) nothing new to the marketing discipline. But, you know, I think, Nick, the thing that always that we always come back to when we do the Brand Federation Naughty and Nice list every year is is that the idea that brands are more often defined by their behavior than by a flashy ad campaign or a well-written press release, you know, so. So what we look at is uh, are, how have how have these brands who have who have 
uh, stood out either in a good way or a bad way in the year? <laughs> How have they behaved in a way that other brands can learn from and that other marketers can learn from? So, so yeah, we have a little fun with Naughty and Nice. And like you said, we have a third category of, of brands that have done some things this year that Santa isn't quite sure about. And that, that uh, you know, at the end of next year, they might find coal in their stocking or they might find a nice present under the tree. We're not sure. Awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, and it looks like in in comparing lists, uh, we, we we might have some 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 uh, that might have been on the list last year that are are there once again. But uh, who who stands out as we look you, on your naughty list? You have uh, we work Bud Light, Zoom, and Silicon Valley Bank. So of 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 those on your list, uh, Santa, who? Who, who stands out? Oh, man, I think the biggest chunk of coal has got to go to our friends at Bud Light. And as as we remember, Nick, that there, there was a giant dust up with Bud Light a few months ago where um, their marketing team decided to uh, send a six pack of Bud Light to Dylan Mulvaney, who is a uh, a very popular Instagram influencer uh, who has been who has been chronicling her her transition, her gender transition on social media. And they sent her a celebratory six pack of Bud Light, which she of course posted on Instagram and thanked them for, which sent some of their customer base into a little bit of a tailspin. Uh, and next thing you know, you had people like Kid Rock, you know, shooting cases of Bud Light with yeah. rifles and, you know, massive boycotts that that lived on the on the right side of the political spectrum, who were offended by Bud Light's support of Dylan Mulvaney, the transgender uh, influencer, and and I, I think Bud Light kind of Bud Light landed on the naughty list for a few reasons related to this. One is, you know, clearly they didn't quite understand their customer base well enough to anticipate that this might happen if they supported somebody like Dylan Mulvaney, leaving whether that support was was warranted or not kind of out of the conversation. If you don't understand your customer base well enough, you walk into buzz saws the way Bud Light walked into a buzz saw here. So that was <laughs> kind of the first thing they did wrong. But then when it happened, rather than standing by their stated brand belief, which is that everybody deserves the right to, to, to get together and, and commune around, a, have a beer together and bring people together, they turned tail and basically ran. And and capitulated to this to this uproar and said, you know, we don't want to be divisive and we're sorry about about doing this. They fired the marketing team behind the Dylan Mulvaney um, promotion and and they basically bailed on what should have been an opportunity to underline their brand conviction in a way that was inclusive and hard to hard to uh, hard to argue with. They did the opposite. They turned tail. Um, they gave a really equivocal and wishy-washy kind of press release. And, and all it did, honestly, was convey to people that Bud Light really doesn't stand for, for, for much other than, <laughs> other than you know, fear of the right wing. Next thing you know, they communicate that kind of weakness and their sales go down by something like 12%. It was a massive, massive uh, fail on so many different levels for Bud Light. I think they missed a... They made a mistake, and then they and then they compounded that mistake by the way they reacted to it. Well, and this is a challenge that uh, Bud uh, and Anheuser Busch have, have has had previously too. Uh, I think of the Super Bowl ad a few years back, uh, sharing the the uh, the immigrant story of Adolphus Bush, and that that was met with similar. Uh, fervor. And it's a real challenge uh, because you could have an organization that is wanting to lead on some of these forward thinking issues. But when that doesn't doesn't align with your customer base, that's a, a, a real challenge. I, I'm, is there an easy answer there uh, other than just not leading um, in, in, in a way that you know, maybe their their leadership would like to. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think if you set aside whether you believe Bud Light should have supported Dylan Mulvaney or not, I, I think this is a case. Uh, the lesson that we can learn as marketers is this is a case of a brand that 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 ran away from its conviction in the face of resistance and. 
And what we what we see, and we'll, we'll, we, we've seen it on some of the nice list brands, is that when brands stand up for their conviction in a way that 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 is clear and is proud and is respectful of not just their customers but the the, the population at large, and, and and says, hey, this is what we stand for as a brand, and we believe it for these reasons, and this is why we're going to stick by it. Um, those brands reap some rewards, but when they don't do that, they call into question their leadership, their credibility. Um, all the things that strong brands are are built on, and Bud Light's a, a an, an unfortunate example of a brand who <laughs> who fell victim to that. They didn't do it well. So I want to get to that nice list uh, shortly. But um, I- I- any others on any other big lessons, big takeaways on the naughty side of the ledger? Yeah, the amazing naughty. There are a couple of amazing naughty stories on this on this side, Nick. One is Zoom. So we may remember that, you know, Zoom, Zoom essentially came to the rescue of, of the corporate world during right. the pandemic, right? Everybody realized, wow, I can do business over Zoom in a way that, that, that allows me to continue to continue working while we're all locked up in our houses. And, and Zoom, Zoom became the kind of the default, the go-to way of, con- of conducting business during the pandemic. And that was, that was an amazing thing. Well, fast forward uh, into this year. And now we have the CEO of Zoom deciding to call back his employees into the office because Zoom is not an effective way to have business conversations. <laughs> now let that sit for a second. <laughs> I'm going to come back to my customer base or my employee base and say, hey, you all need to behave in a certain way because the product we make to enable the behavior I want you to stop doing doesn't really work very well. <laughs> it's like yeah. it's like the CEO of Greenpeace requiring all his staff to drive Hummers. Uh, it, it, it doesn't make any sense. So, um, you know, of course that went public, and of course we have now the the revelation of the of the internal message that came from the CEO saying that Zoom doesn't enable them to have you know real robust conversations about business issues, so they need to be back in the office. Well, man, there are millions of companies that count on Zoom to do exactly the thing that the CEO of Zoom says it can't do. <laughs> that seems like a brand mistake to us. So that landed him on the naughty list. Big time and a big disconnect. Uh, you know, almost even, I mean, the, the the Bud Light issue was its own issue. But when it comes to essentially who you are as a business, who you are as a brand, that kind of, it's hard to hard to hard to walk back that kind of dissonance that's that's a big a big gulf yeah i mean you have to you have to eat your own cooking here right i mean yeah. if, if you're zoom the first thing you should do is say wow i'm going to be the i'm going to be the example for the rest of the world about how to use this product in an amazingly productive and awesome way to do business and, and, and to also everything we can to model that for everybody else and, and you know, and, and it's something everyone's struggling with. And if it is a struggle, you know, maybe it's time for a vulnerable conversation. And you know, there's an opportunity to lead, even from the awkwardness of figuring out what work looks like right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, it could be the the danger of, or you know, a fear of being the know it all and not having all of the answers. Uh, own that a little bit, and let's let's go through this together, just like we did with you know the the last kind of bit of uh, uh, the the pandemic, where where we all relied on Zoom uh, as well. I think that's a great point. Wouldn't it be interesting if you were if you were the CEO or the CMO of Zoom to enlist the the users that you've got all over the world to help improve your product to do the things that you don't think it does as well as it could. Uh, that's a that's an that's an incredible uh, that's an incredible opportunity, but to to kind of give up and say, hey, we got to bring everybody back. <laughs> this remote work thing doesn't work very well. If you're Zoom, <laughs> that's that's a problem. On brand, we'll be right back after this. You may know you are listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Izzy House hosts a great podcast called The Space Marketing Podcast. Izzy, tell us what these fine folks will get out of listening. Space Marketing Podcast is where we explore marketing principles, strategies, and tactics through the lens of space. 
I talk space with some very interesting industry professionals about their challenges and successes with marketing in the new commercial space economy. This show is for business leadership, entrepreneurs, and the space curious. Wow. And where in the universe can people subscribe? All of the major channels. And you can also find it on MPN and spacemarketingpodcast.com. You heard her. Go subscribe. You may know you're listening to this show along the Marketing Podcast Network, but did you know there are other great shows on MPN to help your business? Kevin Hunt is one half of a great podcast called Hanson and Hunt on MPN. Kevin, tell us what these fine folks will get out of listening. Hanson and Hunt is a place for marketers and communicators for brands, companies, and organizations of all kinds to stay on top of industry news and trends. Eric Hanson and I discuss things that make them think, things that help them do their jobs better, things that help them hopefully show up smarter with the boss. We are a monthly show. We've been at it since 2014. Awesome. Where can people subscribe? Their preferred podcast app, of course, or head to hansonandhunt.com or follow our show at marketingpodcast.net. You heard him, folks. Go subscribe. Now, back to the show. So we've talked about the naughty brands. Who's Who's been nice this year? All right. Who's been nice? Like, like Let's take the reciprocal, the flip side of the Bud Light story. And look at our friend Garth Brooks, right? So we all know that, that there are entertainers in the world and celebrities in the world who are among the strongest and most powerful brands on earth. And Garth Brooks is certainly one of them, right? Um, so we all know the country singer for, for, his, for his, his, his musical career, but he also opened a bar in Nashville called Friends in Low Places. And he came out with a very strong public statement when he opened that bar saying, we welcome everybody, we love everybody, we believe everybody should drink whatever beer they want to drink. And the only rule for coming to my bar, friends in low places, is to not be a jerk and be nice to everyone and have a great time. And it was, it was a wonderful kind of um, way to push back against all the, all the uproar that was going on, especially in the country music community related yeah. to Bud Light. And it was Garth Brooks standing up for his conviction as a brand in a way that Bud Light failed to do. And it's a great kind of mirror image of, of what didn't happen with Bud Light. You know, that's a great example. I love when there's these uh, there's these 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 contrasting sides uh, of that, because I would think without being, uh, you know, really, you know, without breaking things down to, to generalities, uh, it, it, it say that there's a lot of overlap there between someone that might be a Bud Light drinker and uh, a country music fan. And if that was a concern in opening up an establishment, really finding a way to lead from that, I, I think there's, you know, really at the risk of, of sounding corny, I think looking at country music stars is a great way to bridge what has been a gap for some in understanding and communicating something very challenging. I think I say that because I think of, of Dolly Parton as well as being another, um, you know, musical musician celebrity brand that moves pretty deftly in in that space. I think Dolly Parton was on the list last year as I think she was about on this. our nice list. She's an amazing example of exactly what you said. Yeah, that's ex that's exactly right. And the idea that that you know brand behavior, especially from people who are as influential as as mega stars like Dolly Parton or Garth Brooks, can can change culture and can influence the way we interact with each other. And and when brands like them stand up for what they believe, they have a they have a bully pulpit, you know, as Teddy Roosevelt might say, and people pay attention. So I see that Mattel is on the list and on the nice list. And I have to, uh, I, I have to ask uh, about that because I think, boy, you talk about these things that we've talked about big, big wins, big misses and, and Barbie specifically the Mattel production of something you don't always get a candid look at something but that was a big swing and obviously a, a really big win and i say a big swing because we see mattel actually portrayed in the movie and on the front of of empowering women 
we see them kind of look back in a tongue in cheek manner at some of the things that they did along the way that, that haven't always landed the way that they wanted to, but boy, on, on the 2023 front, uh, a, a great year and no, no surprise they're on the nice list. Isn't it amazing? We actually, when we first drafted the nice list, Barbie was on it, but then we stepped back for exactly the reason you said, and we said, no, 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 the, it's Mattel that did this, that should be on the list because they got, you know, obviously Barbie on the, on the heels of, of Greta Gerwig's movie was, it was kind of immediately transformed from this, what was an icon of, of anti-feminism. It was the unreachable <laughs> beauty ideal that was teaching our daughters the wrong things. And all of a sudden this movie comes out and Barbie becomes uh, kind of a, a, a brand that's associated with female empowerment in a way that you never would have thought Barbie would be, which is a massive win for Barbie as a brand, obviously. But like you said, in the course of doing that, Mattel also showed the courage enough to allow themselves to be portrayed in the movie in a way that a lot of brands would be scared to death to do, but they did it so well and so kind of self-effacingly with, with Will Ferrell as the CEO, <laughs> you know, um, that, that it was a it was a great twofer for Mattel, right? They got all the benefit for their flagship brand product brand of Barbie, but they also got benefit for their corporate brand by participating in that movie in a way that it makes you you can't help but love them. Uh, agreed, and I think it's fair to say here on a podcast episode on on Christmas on the week of of Christmas. Sometimes us us branding and, and marketing folks are are kind of lame hangs uh, because I love. <laughs> staying and watching all of the credits and especially that one because they walk through the old advertisements uh, for a lot of those things. And it was great because it kind of proved out some of those things that some viewers might have not been old enough or 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 thought maybe that's so funny it couldn't possibly be real to to see the ads for. Uh, you know, Alan, who can uh, who can wear all, all of all of Ken's clothes fit him, and so many of these things that had been punchlines came from the reality of the brand, and just being able to 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 laugh and and smile at that is is so key and and paid off big time. And again, so many of these brands that we walk through on the nice list, you hope more people follow the lead of Garth Brooks. Mattel and uh, and so forth. A anybody else that we should we should talk about on nice before we get to the brands? Santa is. Yeah, watching. Let's talk about one more because I think what you're talking about here is so important. This thread that you've identified between Garth Brooks and Mattel, and this third brand that we'll talk about is is this thread of kind of authenticity and and willingness to be who you are. Um, the courage to to in Mattel's case, kind of stand up and be in on the joke. Hey, we get it. Um, you can't help but love that. The, the, the other brand that did something really interesting and courageous in the world of authenticity is Delta Airlines, right? So, so we think of Delta, at least when I think of Delta, as somebody who spends way more time in airports and on planes than I should. <laughs> uh, Delta has done a really pretty great job of creating a customer experience that's enabled by tech. They use design really well. They've, you know, they, they've, they've done a nice job, as nice a job as an airline can be, because flying can be not a great experience sometimes, right? Now, Delta this year came out with a policy aimed at trying to alleviate the overcrowding in their, in their, um, in their clubs, right? And we all know as frequent flyers, the clubs are like this oasis that you can go to in the, in the, in the hell of an airport <laughs> when you're, you're two hours late and you're stuck in O'Hare or wherever. So they came out with this policy saying, hey, we're going to limit access to our clubs. And of course, the people who had their access limited went crazy. I'm a customer. How can you do this to me? I'm never going to fly Delta again. And to their credit, the CEO came out not 48 hours later and said, we've heard the uproar. We were wrong on this one. We're rethinking this policy. Thank you for letting us know. Which is something like actually admitting that you're not perfect yeah. is, is an unbelievable show of authenticity. And it feels, it feels really good. That's a brand that behaved like a like a bunch of human beings and not like some corporate entity who has to be perfect. Yeah, it's it's that admitting mistakes, it's the candor of of Mattel and then on the it's like a whole spectrum that we're covering here because then 
uh, back at, with with Zoom, you know, you could you could retcon that kind of response and say, "See, we're struggling to figure this out too. Right. Uh, we want you to be part of the conversation. We're, we want to get it right as much as you do." And it, there's there's a way to do this, and you hit the nail on the head of sounding like a human. <laughs> yeah, uh, nobody expects you to be perfect, brands. They just expect you to be honest and decent and authentic to who you are and what you care about. And when you screw something up the way Delta did and you come out and say, hey, we got this one wrong. um, If you handle that the right way, the people who love you are going to actually love you more. Yeah. So as we talk about about sounding human, I see that that could be challenging for one of the brands that Santa is watching in 2024. And that uh, being, uh, of course, artificial intelligence, AI. So who, who else are, are we watching and why? So, yes, we are watching OpenAI very closely, um, not surprisingly, given the fact that it's probably the defining technology of our time, right? And if you listen to Elon Musk's deal book interview, which I highly suggest, very interesting listen, um, he'll say that AI could very well destroy the world, but it's okay because it'll make our time on Earth more interesting. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and Elon, maybe, but... You know, the whole, the, the the Sam Altman drama where he was fired and then he was reinstated, you know, it's, yeah. we, we have to watch that brand, not just because it's an interesting corporate drama to watch unfold, which it is, but because it's a corporate drama that's unfolding in a company that that handles maybe the defining technology of our time and we better pay attention to it. Yeah. And, and, you know, uh, from where Elon's sitting, it is an, an interesting vantage point. So often these, these corporate entities that are defining the technology, it's, it's, it's interesting Then when you kind of ensconce it within a business as we've seen with Zuckerberg and, and Meta mm-hmm. and, and, uh, and, and, and others. And I see speaking of the big monoliths out there that we were also watching Apple. Yeah, this was a surprising one when we put it on the list because Apple is obviously it's an iconic brand. It's, you know, one of the, one of the most, if not the most valuable company in the world, right? Um, why the heck would Santa be watching Apple? <laughs> um, and the more we talked about it, the more we realized that Santa's watching Apple because it feels to him like Apple, you know, it, it made its name over decades of these unbelievable products that they would design and put into the world that that changed the way we interacted with technology and that that became so much a part of our lives that we would line up outside the Apple store for hours to buy the next iPhone or to buy the iPod or to buy the iPad or, you know, whatever it is. And to the point where when you when you go online, you should go on go to, go on YouTube and find Steve Jobs' speech to Apple when he he introduced the Think Different campaign. When he talked about we're never going to worry about processor speed. That's not what we're about. We're about bigger things and changing products that change the world. And they actually did it. Mm-hmm. And what Santa realized, Nick, is that as you look over the last couple of years, uh, Apple has been sliding into the business of incremental product improvement. And, processing and, speed. Yeah. The <laughs> thing that Jobs said they wouldn't be about. And Santa uh-huh. wants the next big Apple product and he doesn't see it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, right when you took me back to that, that sound bite of processing speed, I'm like, oh, that's, that's like what all the new, new updates are, are really leading with. So anybody else that we should, uh, we should keep an eye on that you want to highlight? Uh, I'll give you one more. And it's uh, Barnes and Noble, right? The the venerable bookseller brand that those of us who are over a certain age remember very well. Um, so they they came out with a really interesting brand strategy, and they said we have an insight into brand uh, into book selling that says book selling is a fundamentally uh, local experience. So we are going to do away with the standards that define our retail experience from market to market, and we're going to free up each location of Barnes and Noble to do whatever it has to do to bring to life the local book selling experience in their market, which flies in the face of all the, all the traditional wisdom of branding, which is about consistent experience. And, and, you know, when you go into one McDonald's, it feels like the McDonald's in Wichita, just like the McDonald's in Tampa, right? Well, Barnes and Noble is saying, we're doing the exact opposite of that. 
our Barnes and Noble in San Francisco is going to feel like a San Francisco retailer. It's going to have San Francisco flavor, but the Barnes and Noble in Boston is going to feel like a Boston bookseller. So it's going to be interesting to watch yeah. um, whether they can pull off that level of inconsistency in a way that feels authentic to those markets, but also whether a brand like Barnes and Noble can credibly do that. Will the people in Boston believe that Barnes and Noble is a local book selling experience? I don't know. It's just going to be an interesting strategy to watch. It it, it is, and yeah, it, it uh, keeping with the theme of big swings. It's like that's that you know you could almost see it working, but it takes a lot to do that, and you hope that they've got some some standards, some organization to give that kind of freedom requires some real thought internally to structure and we, it really we, does it's going to be super interesting to watch that so they're, they're kind of doubly challenged in the sense that that you know they're flying in the face of consistency will that work and then mm-hmm. the second one is are they the brand to do it right i, I don't know we'll just have to see yeah is that what people are looking for from barnes and noble because we've right. certainly seen some some big misses on on the naughty list uh this year especially with that's not what those customers are looking for right exactly <laughs> Well, you know, it's funny as we uh, start to wrap up the episode, an episode that has existed almost solely of me asking you to list brands. I I always feel bad. And I I said beforehand, you sure you want me to ask you for a brand that's made you smile? Have you used up all of the exemplary brands, good, bad, otherwise? And, And you said, you said you're up for it. So Matt, what is a brand that has made you smile recently oh uh, nick there we could talk about this for hours man you know so don't don't worry we're not going to run low of brands on, on brands <laughs> i will give a shout out and i did this that people are going to think that i'm i'm kind of like uh i'm on the payroll here i promise i'm not on the payroll anymore of the martin agency but my friends at the martin agency did an amazing thing a couple of weeks ago when they kind of broke the internet with their solo stove campaign and snoop dogg Now, that was the campaign where they preceded uh, the advertising part of that campaign with 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 Snoop Dogg tweeting that he was going smokeless. (laughs) Right. Like Snoop Dogg's never going to do that. Right. So all of a sudden the Internet's talking about, oh, my God, Snoop Dogg's going smokeless and he wants you to respect his privacy, which was kind of hilarious. Everybody starts talking about this thing only to have it be revealed that what Snoop Dogg means is that he's going to. uh, buy a solo stove and light a fire and hang out around his, his smokeless solo stove fire. So the whole thing was a cleverly disguised marketing ploy, which made me smile. And, and it's a, it's a big bet to try those kind of things. Cause, cause they stand an equally large chance of pissing you off, <laughs> when they're revealed. Yeah. but this one was funny and it made me smile. And it felt like it was, it, it did all the right things in that kind of world of, of marketing stunts. So I got a smile out of it. Well, we talk a lot about brands that, uh, that are personal brands, uh, throughout all of this. And I'd say Snoop is a personal brand. Like you said, it can go either way. That's where really it comes down to the personal brand that you've aligned yourself with. And I think, boy, uh, Snoop is is one that that I always love, and I say that uh, with his with his cookbook on my shelf, and uh, probably uh, some some bottles of of wine and other things to enjoy here as as yeah, the holidays. Yeah, things that Snoop likes to enjoy, Nick. But I, yeah. I, I I do think that you're right that 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 aligning with him helps because it's hard not to like Snoop Dogg uh, but but you know there's also a deftness in a in a craft and a thought that has to go into those kind of stunts otherwise they feel ham-handed and you feel manipulated and it just makes you angry and this one made me smile well that is awesome and as we've listed off all of these brands it is a reminder we've gone through these we've not covered all of the brands on the list but we uh, I have Matt's full list that I'll be uh posting with the show notes here at onbrandpodcast.com uh Matt where can folks go to learn more about who you are and what you do check out brandfederation.com We are a marketing and branding strategy consultancy. Uh, We work with clients all over the country, um, 
we're headquartered in Richmond, Virginia, but we've got some terrific people all over the country and actually even in, into Europe now. So uh, yeah, check us out, brandfederation.com. Awesome. And we will link up to that in our show notes, which folks can find again at onbrandpodcast.com. Matt Williams, a.k.a. Branding Santa Claus, thank you for once again sliding down that chimney with us this holiday season. Ho, 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 Nick. You are very welcome. <laughs> uh, happy holidays and Merry Christmas to, uh, to you and yours and everybody out there in podcast land. On Brand is part of the Marketing Podcast Network. If you like what you're hearing, if we've made you smile, you can always listen free on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or whatever your favorite platform may be. And please take a moment and rate and review the podcast to help others find the show. Until next week, I'm Nick Westergaard, and I'll see you on the internet. This podcast is heard along the Marketing Podcast Network. For more great marketing podcasts, visit marketingpodcasts.net.